Well, welcome everybody and thank you for uh, watching this video about the Apostle Paul's Gospel Fully Explained. Now, as an introduction to this, uh, the Apostle Paul's Gospel, as it's been shown to me by Jesus, is a companion gospel to the Gospel of Jesus Christ. If Christians are saved by faith alone and by grace alone and by God alone, as many are told in their churches, which relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as many preachers profess, I ask, on what basis can the following verses of scripture be ignored? So Jesus asked, or he said, Verily, verily, I, Jesus, say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to, unto my Father, in John 14, 12. So Jesus is emphasising that not only should Christians do the same works that he did, which was raising the dead and healing the sick and the blind and the deaf and the maimed, um, he's saying greater works than these shall he do. Mm. So we don't see too much of that in the churches today. Mm. And, and the Apostle James says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without the works associated with that faith is dead also. So how can Christians and preachers of the gospel ignore the requirements here for works to be associated with our faith? So in other words, the gospel of Jesus Christ is aimed at unsaved sinners. Its aim is to have them accept Christ's blood as payment for their past sins. If the sinner confesses Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour, they are what I understand is initially saved as stated in Romans 10, 9 and 10, where if you confess, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, thou shalt be saved. Now the Apostle Paul's gospel aims to transform or perfect the saved Christian uh, for service to God here on the earth. That's the whole purpose of becoming a Christian. Such service, if performed as the Bible says, will produce spiritual fruit unto God, as stated in John 15, 1 to 8. If no fruit or an insufficient quantity of fruit is produced, the Christian has no salvation. Now, that is, those are two warnings by Jesus in John mm -hmm. 15, 2 and 6. Mm -hmm. So I want to, want to just provide a rare example of Ephesians 2, verses 7 to 9. Now, that says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So here we have a mixture of um, scripture that are sort of emphasising things in different directions, and we've got to understand what the core message is here. So in rare situations relating to faith alone, by grace alone, and by God alone, if an unsaved sinner was on a hospital trolley waiting for surgery and a Christian in the medical team shares the gospel with that person and Jesus Christ was accepted as that person's saviour and they die on the operating table, he or she, she goes immediately to be with Jesus as promised in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 and Romans 10, 9 and 10. Water baptism is not necessary because it was by faith alone and by grace alone and by God alone that the sinner was saved. Mm -hmm. However, in the typical Christian's lifetime that most Christians, um, you know, e exist in, however, most Christians often live many decades beyond the day they accepted Christ as their saviour. God's strict requirement for entry into heaven is that all Christians must become perfected in this life to the same standard as God the Father is perfect. For such Christians to be granted into entry into heaven by him, this is clearly stated in the verses below. So Jesus said in Matthew 5 verse 48, and this is a commandment, be therefore perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And Jesus said in John 14 verse 15, if you love me, keep or do my commandments and this is one of the most explicit commandments that you can get and jesus said uh sorry um yeah jesus speaking in matthew 19 21 he said if thou wilt be perfect 
Go and sell all that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. So this is these are the requirements that if you want to be per perfected, you know, with the rich young ruler, he had he, he loved his wealth and he loved his prosperity and, and that life that he had, that, that gave him. And mm -hmm. Jesus said, well, go and give it to the poor and follow me. Um, so those are basic requirements. Now, Jesus said in Luke 6.40, the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master meaning perf perfected ultimately in this life. So that's emphasizing what's been written above. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said in John 17, 23, I in them, meaning all of members, the members of Christ's spiritual body on, on earth, and thou in me, that they, meaning all the Christians, may be made perfect in one. Now, Jesus often, well, he said on occasions that um, he and the Father were one, meaning that they were in perfect unity on everything. There was no divisions between them. They never mm -hmm. argued about anything. They came to an agreement. They discussed things. And this is what they want the Christians here to do on earth. They want us... Whatever our beliefs are, we are to share our beliefs and we're supposed to use the, the Bible as our guide. Mm -hmm. If our beliefs contradict what the Bible says, we're to get rid of those beliefs because they're lies. And we're mm -hmm. to embrace then what the Bible says and we've got to have that harmony. Right. And, and speaking also in 2 Corinthians 13, 9, Paul says, and this also we wish even your perfection. So he's wishing that Christians in those days would become perfected. And this is what I wish today, but I'm struggling to find Christians who uh, even want to discuss the, the question of perfection. Mm -hmm. so, so this is the core of what we're here today. Now, if Christians obey the words of Christ and the words of the Apostle Paul in particular, God promises such Christians will rule and reign with Christ throughout eternity. So there's some scripture verses there that confirm that. And um, Paul says, Know ye not that we shall judge angels, and I say, in the next life? How much more important is it to judge the things that pertain to this life? So Christians have got to show that they know where they have a responsibility to judge things, particularly that happen in the church, mm -hmm. and where they don't have that responsibility. And I say every Christian is going to be either commended or condemned if they haven't judged righteously the sermons that they've listened to in the pews. Right. Everybody is supposed to have their Bibles open when there is a sermon being preached in the pew, and if it's incorrect, if it contradicts the word of God, or things have been willfully left out, they're then to follow up with the preacher in a loving and caring way and to mm. say, and just ask questions. You know, you said this, my Bible says that. How do you explain the difference? Right. So that's really the, the basis of everything. Now here it says that we're not to judge according to the appearance of what things look like, but we are to judge righteous judgment. Now, to judge righteously, we're supposed to gather all the evidence that pertains to the situation. We're supposed to look and compare it to what the Bible says. And I'm just talking in a, in a church environment here. And if somebody like, an, like a pastor is not behaving properly, we're supposed to look at the Bible and see how he is supposed to act. And if he's acting unrighteously, we're supposed to bring it to his attention. And if he doesn't listen to us, we then take it to an elder or someone in authority and take it from there. But right. that's that's the, the basis of if we're going to be able to judge angels, we should be able to judge righteous judgment here on the earth, at least in the church. Mm -hmm. So, however, to be given such an awesome responsibility of judging angels, God has placed numerous conditions that each Christian must meet in this life if he or she sincerely hopes to enter into heaven when they die. One of these vitally important conditions is this. 
follow peace with all men. So we're going to live peace peaceably. We're not just to get disagreeable and, and uh, anything like that. But we're also to demonstrate holiness because without demonstrating holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Mm -hmm. Look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Now, this is a, a real, really serious uh, concern because in Gal Galatians 2.21, Paul says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. So if grace is given to us and we've got to know um, how it functions, um, we can frustrate grace, God's grace if we don't use it the way he's um, you know, given it to us for. And if we continue frustrating God's grace, we can ultimately fail of God's grace. And if we fail of God's grace, then we're looking at the judgment of God. Mm -hmm. And this is really what's happening in a lot of the churches today. Yeah. So it says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many Christians be defiled. So if we're, if we're looking at Christians who are really, um, you know, they've got bitterness in them, because um, this is the root of bitterness here, and there are some people who have been um, offended by what's going on in the church, and they, they seem to take uh, pleasure in ridiculing the church and mocking Christians and what have you, I would say that these have not only frustrated God's grace, they've failed at God's grace, and this is the fruit that's coming from their, their form of faith. Mm -hmm. so, so we've got to be careful that we don't end up the same way. Mm -hmm. So if Christians fail to achieve the same level of holiness as God the Father exhibits, this must mean they have no salvation. So that's the, the warning here. So my question is, why two Gospels? In this process of the transformation of sinful mankind into kings and priests who rule and reign with Christ in the next life, that's in Revelation 5.10, and to become on this earth worthy ambassadors for Jesus Christ in this life, God has provided the following process of preparing sinners who have fully repented from their sinful ways to spend eternal life with him. Well, significantly, the Bible says that God the Father will use Jesus Christ as his judge when using Paul's gospel to determine whether Christians have obeyed it or not. If Christians have failed to obey Paul's gospel, this indicates that they have no salvation. So in Romans 2.16, it says, In the day of judgment, when God the Father shall judge the secrets of Christian men and women by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, so this is a gospel that Jesus Christ gave the Apostle Paul. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And I'll explain more about this. But they, meaning most of today's Christians, have not all obeyed the Apostle Paul's gospel. For Isaiah, and it's stated clearly in Isaiah 53.1, saith, Lord, who amongst your people hath believed our report? Now, Isaiah stated that first he was reaching out to the Jews in, of his day and they rejected his word as a prophet. Uh, Jesus quoted um, Isaiah 53 1 when he said Lord who hath believed our report. The apostle Paul he is saying in his day with the Jews Lord who hath believed our report and now I say in these days Lord who hath believed my report that the apostle Paul's gospel has to be obeyed. So this is how it is over the last 3,000 years. Now in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 8 to 9, it says here in flaming fire, and this is in with Jesus Christ returning to the earth, taking vengeance upon them, meaning today's Christians, that know not God. That means having a personal relationship with God the Father and mm -hmm. with Jesus Christ. And that, and because they don't have that relationship, they obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That he, and I'm saying it's the one that he gave to Paul, the one that uh, that stated in Galatians 1, 11 and twelve that Paul neither received it of man, but was given 
personally by the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the one that contains a mystery. So, uh, and I'll explain that further. Yeah, it says here, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power to those who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the warning in this uh, scripture verse. So my next heading is the two gospels that must be obeyed. Now for Paul's gospel to achieve this huge change in an unsaved person's character, God has established the following two gospels in the Bible that must be obeyed for anyone seeking to spend eternity with God and Christ. So the first one is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this simple gospel allows a sinner to repent from their sins and to accept Christ as their saviour and to take this initial step needed to enter God's kingdom by faith alone, by grace alone, and by God alone. However, remaining at such a low level of knowledge of God and understanding and commitment relating to God and his kingdom is unacceptable to both God and Christ. And through this, we've got to, as a commandment, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, as stated by Peter. And for this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with all the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might, here's the word might, uh, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So this is an unending, you know, that we it talks about the unsearchable riches of, of God and his kingdom. Mm -hmm. And things are truly unsearchable, but, you know, we've got to increase in the knowledge of God because, before we can have revealed to us the things that God wants us to know. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is emphasising what the gospel of Jesus Christ represents. It doesn't take people a lot into God's kingdom because we're like Hebrews uh, chapter 6 verse 1 says, therefore leaving uh, behind us uh, the principles and the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. And mm -hmm. that leaving behind the principles and the doctrine of Christ represents the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything that you need to know about Christ and his life on earth and um, you know, how he suffered, how he died, how he rose again from the dead, all those things, there's a massive amount of knowledge and there's a lot of Christians that have far more knowledge about that sometimes than I do. But we're mm -hmm. supposed to have every knowledge of that so we can go out and witness to people. And when they ask us questions, we've got full understanding of, you know, what we, we believe and, and what they need to embrace as well. So we do need to have all of these uh, knowledge, this knowledge, and it's not just a historical knowledge. It says down here that we're all supposed to have spiritual understanding. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, there's a, there's a lot in, in that gospel of Jesus Christ alone. However, when we move on to the Apostle Paul's gospel, this aims to take us from that um, base knowledge, if you like, about Jesus Christ to, to ultimately perfect the Christian for him and her to be able to think, act and judge in the same manner as God and Christ would do if they were on the earth. That's just my understanding in a sentence. So it also aims to transform the former sinner or the new Christian using Paul's gospel to prepare him and her for spending eternity in heaven. Mm. So this gospel, Paul's gospel, if obeyed, is necessary to complete the transformation as God will not in any way associate with unrepentant sinners who refuse to become like clay in the potter's hand. And right. so, so we have to, so where we've um, been living like, um, children that have had no rules and no, um, re, you know, behaviour patterns, no parent to sort of show us spiritually what we should be behave like. Ultimately, this is what we're supposed to be like, play in the potter's hand. So he can say, well, you're soft and, and malleable 
and I now want to change you into the shape that I want you to be. And you've got to be prepared to change your life from what it is to what God wants you to become. And that's what he that's what he's done with me. And that's why I say these words. Right. So so in Romans 12, 2, um, the, the Apostle Paul says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for you in your life. That's what it's all about. So you can't do that if you're still conformed to this world. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember about the seed that fell on the, th the three types of soil. Well, there was four there. There was the wayside. But the three, there was only one. The seed that fell into good ground ultimately produced fruit. And this is what, what it is because the seed that fell in that person's soil of their heart, the spiritual soil, they became transformed by the renewing of their mind and they proved these things and, um, and changed. So that's really what I'm emphasising there. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is what it's all about. We've got to have a changed mind and become that new creature in Christ. So from an illustrative point of view, um, this is a comparison of the two Gospels. So with the Gospel of Jesus Christ here, um, who was it directed to? So it's directed to all unsaved sinners in this world. And the result is that they accept Christ as their saviour. That's with by speaking with the mouth and from their heart. They become water baptised. They become discipled within the church that they attend. They are there uh, uh, to study the Gospels and they're to commence the race that's set before them. And I won't say any more at the moment. Um, but the Apostle Paul's Gospel, as a comparison, so to whom is it directed? It's to the disciples of Jesus Christ. So disciple, discipleship is, man, is a mandatory requirement for salvation. Mm -hmm. And I'll explain that in a moment. But people who simply believe in Jesus and the Jesus they're taught in the churches, um, it, it won't get them very far. It'll get them greater condemnation. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, so the result of, people becoming disciples is that they achieve the new birth and they then become the new creature in Christ. They become a member of the body of Christ and they then are able to complete the race that God has set before them and ultimately then if they finish the race successfully, they endure to the end to be saved they are then ready for, to enter into heaven when they die. So mm. this is real. This is what the, the two Gospels represent. And I say that one is a companion Gospel to the other. You can't have one without the other. Right. And, if you, and if people are only focused on the Gospel of Jesus Christ, it means that they're not even really babes in, uh, in, in, in the church or in the kingdom of heaven. They haven't had that new birth to become a baby. So um, we'll just leave that at, at that stage at the moment. So again, another uh, view of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this is aimed to snatch the sinner off the broad way that leads to destruction in hell, Matthew 7, 13, and onto the narrow way that leads to eternal life with God and Christ. However, for any Christian to simply remain as a reformed sinner, either completely, and there's a lot of Christians who still pray that, uh, you know, that they're struggling with sin in their lives. Well, you know, they haven't progressed at all. Um, so people have got to become a, a totally reformed sinner, just like a person's become a totally reformed alcoholic or a totally reformed smoker or drug addict. Mm -hmm. um, if they've given away their drugs or their cigarettes or their alcohol and they're a reformed sinner, there's nothing you can do to get them to go back to the habit that they had. And mm. that's exactly the way we are to view sin and and get rid of it because it's detestable to God and it should by rights be detestable to ourselves. Right. So um, 
On the contrary, God, God wants his people walking in the spirit. It states that in Romans 8 verse 1 and along the narrow way that leads to eternal life with God and Christ. And so here um, I've got a, a man here who's got a ball and chain attached to his ankle and that chain, uh, the ball represents sin. Now, Jesus wants to send, send his disciples out to uh, he, he, he snatch these people like a fisherman would snatch a fish out of the ocean yeah. and reel that person into God's kingdom. So he uses the gospel of Jesus Christ as spiritual bait on his hook. And that's what Jesus has shown me, and I, it fits in perfectly with everything that I've been saying here. So uh, probably about 10 years ago, um, this uh, I had this illustration uh, created for me by an artist. So down here we have what is um, the Broadway. Now, if somebody is travelling along this Broadway here, and I'll just go down a bit, and they get saved by hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they come to this um, signpost here. This signpost is pointing to the narrow way, the straight gate, and the fiery trials. And of course, if they do experience the new birth, then Christ has a cross for them, which is representative of a burden that he has for them to carry on his behalf. And mm -hmm. they've got to enter into the narrow way that mm -hmm. leads to eternal life. Now, the thing is that this is a difficult way. It's not an easy way to go. There are a lot of troubles ahead and a lot of people don't want that. And there's a lot of preachers who say you don't need to, to go that way. Mm -hmm. It's an easy way. So you can find that you might find another um, signpost down here that says, look, you know, it's a bit too difficult going this way. You, you take, take a turn back here and it's easy. Well, some people do do that. And that they're representative of the seed that fell on shallow ground or thorny ground. They get down here and they find it's just too difficult and they turn back. But for those who the seed has fallen into good ground and they continue on in faith and they endure their trials, they come up to where there is a fiery trial here. And these fiery trials, there could be several of them, but Jesus leads his people through these fiery trials. And like um, if you've ever seen gold that's in a crucible and it's heated up, um, all the dross floats to the top when the gold is in a liquid form. And, um, you know, the person who's doing that then scrapes the dross off and then turns the heat up until there's no more dross uh, appearing. And really, uh, someone sh showed me many, many years ago that we are like gold in that sense in these fiery trials. And when God looks into we as being that gold without dross, he's supposed to see his face reflected mm -hmm. in us in that situation. So mm -hmm. this is an encouragement to keep on with the fiery trials. And ultimately, this is your cross that you've carried for Jesus through all this distance. And you can place it next to Christ's cross here and as, as a son of God. And so ultimately then that means that you've, this could be symbolic of the race that's set before us. And once you complete your race, and you've got that prize, well, then you have the right to inherit the pearly gates up here and entry into heaven at your death. Yeah. So yeah. that's uh, that's um, uh, an illustration that I had produced probably 10 years ago. So, however, for any Christian to remain as a reformed sinner, meaning completely or partially, this is not what God's plan of salvation is all about. On the contrary, remaining at this very low level of salvation faith is Satan's plans, plan for God's people. Satan does not want God's people to progress or grow spiritually. It is his desire to keep all Christians ignorant of God's requirements and for his people to remain unaware of their obligations related to their salvation. So, Let's uh, focus a little bit here on the Apostle Paul's gospel. 
So the Apostle Paul's gospel demands that Jesus must become more like God and Jesus Christ spiritually. This means they must each cast off or com uh, completely and nothing being retained their old Adamic sinful nature and to replace our old man nature, which it's referred to in Romans 6 verse 6, by putting on Christ and his sinless, loving and kind nature. So Romans 13 verse 14 says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the temptations of the flesh and to fulfill the lusts thereof. So this means that all Christians must become holy as God is holy, righteous as stated by Jesus, loving the truth that you might be saved in 2 Thessalonians 2.10, loving one's enemies, and that can sometimes be difficult, and loving all others. Those are just a few of the requirements that I picked out. To commence this process of perfecting the saints, God demands that all Christians must become a devoted disciple of Jesus Christ and be willing to follow Jesus wherever he leads them. So if Christians do not want to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, I say, well, really, do they have salvation, the salvation that will lead them into heaven when they die? Now, they're also required to study the scriptures to become approved by God. So it's like going through a university course. If you don't study and uh, you don't pass those exams and meet the requirements, that you've agreed to, um, you know, attain uh, to get a, uh, a qualification. It's the same process here with God. He's He set the uh, the scene for being approved unto God, and one of those first things is study, and you have to study all the way through. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the next thing is to become born again, where God gives such a Christian a new heart, a new spirit and a heart of flesh. Now, those are stated in Ezekiel 36, 26. Now, even though it's in the Old Testament, God says if he's going to do that to the Jewish people, he's going to do it to us too because we're all treated the same. We were all rebels and he wants his children to come into his kingdom, whether they be Jew or Gentile. So if he's going to give the Jews a heart of flesh, meaning their heart is open to hearing God, and wanting to please him and to do his will, then it's open to the Gentiles as well. And I'm saying that I received a heart of flesh. I received a new heart and a new spirit when I had my new birth experience. Mm -hmm. And and this is to enable the transformation process of perfection to commence. Now, we've got to also prove what is sound doctrine and what is false doctrine. And false doctrine is called heresies in the Bible and, uh, and in these Titus scripture references and, and Galatians and Peter. And we are required to oppose what is false doctrine. Now, we're also required to commence running in the spiritual race that God has set before every Christian to run. And that's stated here in these verses. And in the illustration that's uh, shown below, this illustration shows the, and illustrates the race that God has set before every Christian to run for what I term their final salvation. So here, if we've got a st every race has a start line and every race has a finish line. Uh, you will also find that in every race, there's quite often an entry fee because if there's an entry fee for the participants, that entry fee quite often goes towards the prize for the winner of the race. And so if we look at Christians who accept Jesus Christ as their saviour and they're what I term simple salvation or initially saved, they may well also be water baptised and they enter the church. Um, they, they're, they're then located at the start line and you could say that Jesus Christ has paid the, um, the, the fee to enter into the race with his blood. To me, that's the entrance fee to get every Christian up to the start line of their race. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. It's cost them nothing. This is the free gift mentioned in the scriptures there that gets them to the race. Mm -hmm. Now, they're required to run. And this is after the new, new birth occurs. And people are to use their Bibles as their, um, uh, as their map along the way. And they're to use the, their relationship with Jesus, God the Father and the Holy Spirit as their means of guidance along the way. So that if um, the devil's people turn the signposts into the wrong direction or they put snares along the way, um, remember the devil has devices to try and trick and, uh, you know, corrupt God's people. Um, God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit will reveal these along the way. And so the Christian continue to run to the end of their race. Now, mm. once I get towards the finish line, this Philippians 3 verse 14 is the mark of high calling that we are to aim for. So it's just like firing an arrow. You want to aim at the bullseye. If you hit outside the circle, uh, you haven't won anything. You've got no points at all. But you're, you've are you got to aim toward the mark of high calling. So this is perfection. This is what perfection means. And it means also that we've got to be the overcomer. We've got to know what Satan's devices are and where to avoid them and overcome them. And Jesus said, as I have overcome, so should you overcome. Mm -hmm. so, so this is really what the right, uh, so it says here, and let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And then in here I've put, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain so this is a may obtain there there are conditions associated with the running that you have to meet to obtain mm -hmm. and one of these conditions is strive to enter in and yeah. that's exactly what the leader of the race is often doing he's striving ahead of the pack and if the pack most of the pack is sitting there in the churches waiting at the start line well, they don't have any salvation. They just believe that they have. Whereas this man here who's left the pack behind and he's following Jesus with his Bible and a, and a personal relationship with those in the Trinity, um, he's aiming towards this final uh, salvation race. Mm -hmm. So with that, there's an explanation here. So the following two stages explain in more detail the claims made in the illustration above. So the gospel of Jesus Christ or simple salvation. This gospel of Jesus Christ is to be preached by all Christ's disciples. Its aim is to offer any unsaved individual salvation that Christ obtained for them through the blood he shed at Calvary's cross. The emphasis is that Christ's blood ransomed our soul from spending eternity in hell. It represents a price that no man could pay for himself or on behalf of anyone else. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That's what mm. Jesus said. Now, for those who respond to this message in faith, it says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this is a very broad statement here it means wherever you are in your salvation race you will be saved if you continue running um, but it's uh, satan's plan to divert christians from that race and um, we'll leave it there mm -hmm. so once the seed of the gospel impacts a sinner's heart and he or she repents from their sin and confesses jesus christ is now lord of their life the scripture says that such a person is saved according to Romans 10, 9 and 10. This level of faith that involves no works on the sinner's part, it is seen by God as initial salvation. This is because it is the free gift given by both God and Christ to repentant sinners. This new Christian stage of spiritual development is indicated by the start sign in the illustration below. And so in this illustration, we have the start line down here which is romans 10 9 and 10 and 
people have to strive in this area here once they've moved up into that spiritual realm. I've also turned at the religious life because everybody who's unsaved down here has to enter the church to, to learn what they need to know from the Bible. And so this can be the religious life. But the problem is a lot of people only ever attain to this very low level. They need the new birth to then become the base level of the spiritual life shown here on the right. Mm. And so once they become, have the new birth, they then become a baby. And then the, the, uh, the, the works and the fruit follow some of those things. Just, just, this is a very early drawing, but it's aiming to show that there's a growth stage in here. So you've got the baby, you've got the little child, you've got the young man, you've got the father, and you have the good soldier of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So these are other growth stages because God wants sons and daughters uh, in, into, into his kingdom, and they can only come through the new birth. Right. And, of course, it is Satan's plan to thwart every Christian along every pro, you know stage of spiritual growth to prevent them from achieving maturity and and particularly the fruit that they should produce from this point onwards mm -hmm. so you can see that we're supposed or required to grow in grace in 2 Peter 3 we're supposed to uh, in 2 Peter 1 5 to 8 increase in faith virtue knowledge temperance patience, godliness, brotherly kindness and charity. These are all new um, virtues that we're supposed to exhibit as Christians to show that we are um, maturing. And we're also supposed to produce spiritual works that produce spiritual fruit. So mm. that's uh, that's that, that chart that I produced quite some time ago. So the aim of both God and Jesus Christ is to assist the newly discipled Christian to achieve sport, full spiritual maturity through the stages shown and to reach the finish line or final salvation of their life's journey with Christ. So that like Paul, when he came to be offered at the end of his life, he said, I have fought a good fight, meaning of defending the faith. And that's referenced in Jude. I have finished my course or the race that was set before him. He says, I have kept the faith despite Satan's temptations throughout for me to deny Christ. Well, we know that Peter denied Christ three times. So Paul didn't do that. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. So there's the prize uh, at the end of the finish line, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And now there's a day of judgment. There's a day of judgment for the righteous, which is the first resurrection. And there's a day of judgment for the, um, the sinners or those who fail to finish their race. Mm -hmm. That's the second resurrection. And then he says, and not for me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So we move on to stage two, which is the Apostle Paul's gospel or final salvation. And the Apostle Paul's gospel that he terms my gospel is stated in Romans 2.16, 16.25 and 2 Timothy 2.8. Now, um, and these require the newly saved Christians to now become as sinless as Christ is sinless, as holy as God is holy, and as perfect as God is perfect. These are the three fundamental requirements um, that, you know, there's no, there's no negotiating, sorry about that, there's no negotiating any of these things. Mm -hmm. So Jesus said unto him, the rich young ruler who desired eternal life with Christ, if thou wilt be perfect and therefore eligible for entry into heaven, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. So <clears throat> the, this was uh, pretty much, you could uh, associate this with many Christians today. 
Uh, we are a very wealthy, um, you know, the Western world is very wealthy, you know, with our cars, our houses, our jobs, our income, and the food we eat and the clothes we wear. Um, but, you know, Jesus is saying, well, if thou wilt be perfect, sell all that thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. I mean, that's very, very hard for anybody to do. But in my, um, and I'll say this, um, in when when I, I got on my knees when my wife and my children walked out of my life and I said, Jesus, I want to follow you. And uh, and I was I <laughs> I met another Christian woman who was older than me um, in a Pentecostal church and married her some two years afterwards. And this woman uh, and her um she uh, in this Pentecostal church, they were there was a coven of witches, and she was one of them. Oh, and wow. we were only married for eighteen months, and uh, she yes. basically kicked me out of my house that was about twenty. I'd lived in for about twenty four years, and uh, her and her husband conspired to rob me. Uh, her ex husband, sorry, her and her ex husband conspired to rob me of my home, and they did that. Wow. And so, um, so I, I often summarise it by saying my first wife robbed me of my money and my children, not in the right order, of course, my children and my money, but my second wife robbed me of my house and everything that was in it. So pretty much um, when I said to Jesus that I wanted to follow him, this is what followed. And my whole life got turned upside down. Mm -hmm. And so I was in Western Australia at the time. I came across the continent to my mother who lived in Melbourne in Victoria mm -hmm. and I lived with her for eight and a half years and I did street evangelism and I did a lot of things to try and, um, you know, um, witness for Jesus and try and bring fruit into his kingdom. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and it was um, after eight and a half years, the Lord uh, introduced me to my lovely wife that I'm married to now. And we've been married very happily together for the last 20 years and it's been a joy and so this what i say through all of this is that i've had a job experience mm -hmm. if we know, you know that the lord said to satan hast thou considered my servant job and the first stage of it was that job lost his children and his houses and everything pretty much that was physical in his life that had value and mm -hmm. he had a lot of value um it was all gone and he said, the Lord, the, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Right. And then the Lord said to Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? And, uh, and then the Lord allowed Satan to afflict his body. And he said, but don't take his life. So Job had all these sores over his body for an unknown period of time. So in my life, in um, the last uh, three or four years, I haven't got a record of it. I never kept a record, but I had a, um, a condition known as spinal stenosis, where the spinal column narrowed as it went down near the pelvis. And this caused extreme pain, pain that was totally unbearable at many times uh, for at least two and a half years. Wow. And um, I could not get up and walk. I couldn't stand. Um, I found life very difficult and uh, was and I took no drugs, no painkillers at all during this time. I uh, just used prayer and um, and it's only since September last year that I've been um, recovering from that and now I'm totally healed. Wow. And so praise cool. the Lord. So um, I did go to a neurosurgeon. This neurosurgeon said that it would be cost about $25,000 to have an operation to uh, do what they do in these situations. He couldn't give me any um, guarantee that it would be successful. But I just put my faith in Jesus and said, I'm relying on you, Lord. So I've got um, MRI scans to prove, you know, that I've had that. Um, but my point here is, is that, um, you know, when you say that you want to take up your cross and follow Jesus, 
you've got to be able to be serious about it no matter what comes. Some right. could say this, this is a fiery trial to test you. Well, you know, God uses Satan to test his people. He doesn't want to test them himself. Right. And Satan's the perfect uh, individual to test God's people. But right. God is always there to, you know, teach you the lessons. And sometimes they're hard lessons, but they're eternal lessons that we need to know if we're going to enter into eternal life with Christ and uh, be able to judge righteously the way Jesus would. Sure. So anyway, I just throw that in for what it's worth. I may um, do another video about my uh, ailments, if you like. It's not the only one that I've had, but that's probably the, uh, the you could call it the worst and most uh, profound um, sickness that I've suffered. But it's also, I also say that... Um, you know, we are, the Bible says that we are to glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are his. Uh -huh. And and if our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and he allows Satan to afflict us with things like spinal stenosis, then ultimately you can use that as a testimony to others who uh, need to be shown the way of the narrow way or, you know, um, what discipleship is is likely to you know be an endurance test for? So, yeah. praise the Lord. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yes, Amen. However, it's apparent that most Christians today are unaware of these two gospels. So that's the initial and final uh, salvation, or stages of yeah initial and final salvation being necessary so as to attain the required standard of perfection for entry into heaven. This aim, therefore, or this claim rather therefore asserts that there will be few Christians today who will be eligible to enter into the rapture or into heaven at their death. However, this situation was prophesied to occur as stated below. So then said one, meaning one of Christ's disciples, unto him, Lord, are there few Christians that be saved? And he, meaning Jesus, said unto them, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many Christians, I say unto you, will seek to enter in after the rapture has happened and shall not be able. Now, the verses that go on beyond uh, verse 23 are illustrative of Christians who have been left behind after the rapture. And um, Christians need, who, and there are many Christians today who question whether the rapture is really one of those real things mentioned in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. So... We need, Christians need to start doing their studies. And uh, I've put out a video here about the rapture and especially about the wise and foolish virgins and that parable and what it represents. So, um, you know, come back to me. If you want to learn, there's plenty of information and mm. it's all biblical uh, that I preach. There's nothing here that's from, um, you know, the words of any preacher. All right. <clears throat> so the above claim of few Christians being eligible to into heaven harmonize with the lamentations below of the following three prophets in their day who found that God's people preferred to embrace the lies of Satan told to them by their priests rather than believing and then doing what God's word said. So we've got Isaiah the prophet and he says in um, Isaiah 53 1 Lord who hath believed our report and Jesus Christ quoted Isaiah by saying, Lord, who hath believed our report in John 12. And the Apostle Paul uh, said about God's people failing to obey God's word as he requires. But they, meaning today's Christians with their Bibles, have not all obeyed the Apostle Paul's gospel. For Isaiah 53 saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So sadly, I feel that I can echo the words of Isaiah today by saying, Lord, who throughout the Christian community hath believed my report about the necessity of Paul's gospel to be obeyed? Now, if people that I've contacted, I've contacted over 250 ministries over the last five years. I've written to them through their emails and I've shared a little bit with them to try and to try and get them to uh, communicate, you know, mm -hmm. to get into a discussion, mm -hmm. and all I all I get is silence. In other words, my it's it's like my email went to the dead letter office, mm -hmm. and it, never to be opened. And I 
suggest that these people probably don't know their Bibles like they should. They find scripture offensive because mm -hmm. it contradicts what they've believed and quite often believed for several decades. Right. And because that would then put them in opposition to the time and the money they're invested in their ministry, they think, but this isn't a popular gospel. You know, it means that people are likely to lose their salvation unless they achieve perfection. Mm -hmm. And um, because of that, it means that uh, they've compromised the word of God for their, uh, you know, to keep their ministry going. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is why I say, sadly, I, I feel that I can echo the words of Isaiah. So I've got the evidence and I've even um, had two... Um, um, promotions on Facebook to articles that I've written and excuse me I've promoted my my articles um, in in that way and I've also had a um, Google um, campaign as well advertising my um, my ministry mm -hmm. and it's all amounted to nothing I've had very little response in fact none that mm -hmm. I can speak of mm -hmm. so Anyway, I'll just move on a little bit here. I've still got a long way to go. Uh, the Apostle Paul's Gospel explained the that the following 10 points help explain what God has established as the requirements Christians must meet to obeying Paul's Gospel. So Christ requires his committed disciples to follow him. So in this example, Simon Peter, when Jesus said to Peter, follow me, he immediately abandoned his parents, friends and fishing business to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And Matthew, the same happened to him, um, but he it was his taxation business that he left. So these men, including Levi and Philip and Nathaniel, all these people forsook everything that they had to become a disciple and to follow Jesus as stated in Matthew. In other words, they counted the cost and they just dropped everything. So yeah. the point here is that Jesus required his disciples to instantly abandon their livelihoods and follow him. Jesus reaffirmed this commitment by saying, if any man come to me and hate not, meaning love far less than Jesus, using hate as the comparison, his father, so you're supposed to Love Jesus far more than your father, your mother, your wife, children, brethren, meaning brothers, your sisters, and your own life also. That person cannot be my disciple. Mm -hmm. So discipleship is mandatory. Jesus doesn't say that in those very plain, simple commands or words, but he's saying that uh, these are the re if you cannot hate not you know your family members you can't be my disciple and mm -hmm. if you do not bear your cross and come and follow after me you cannot be my disciple mm -hmm. and likewise whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath and that includes your houses and your lands and all and even your money uh, he cannot be my disciple so there is a lot to count up to be a genuine disciple of jesus christ right can we um uh, take a break for a minute here and i'll yes um sp we can split it in two it looks like you still yep. have a lot to go yes yes and That's i'll good. stop the recording and then restart it and okay we can make it like part one part two if you part like. two sounds good thanks thanks for that greg okay sure